For a conversation on the future of social media, please welcome Evan Spiegel, the CEO of Snap, here with Atlantic staff writer Derek Thompson. Hello, good afternoon. So Snapchat has 200 million users, thereabouts, but in the off chance that there are some members of the audience who are not among them, can we quickly dispense with definitions? What is Snapchat? So uh, at a really high level, it's a new type of camera that allows you to communicate visually. So the big innovation, people have spent a lot of time uh, communicating via text, you know, letters, emails, text messages for a really long period of time. Snapchat allows you to communicate visually with photos and videos, and that allows you to convey a whole new range of emotion uh, when you're communicating with your friends, which is especially important when you're talking to people that are really close to you. It's not really about conveying information, it's about conveying emotion and, and how you feel. And so Snapchat unlocks that uh, for people. How do you make money? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we, we have two uh, sort of main platforms that we've created over the years. One is a content platform where people create uh, snaps um, and stories and then you know, also publishers and now uh, you know, even have shows uh, like NBC has a great show called Stay Tuned and we sell ads uh, in between uh, those, those pieces of content. And we also have an augmented reality business. So when you use our camera, you can use all of these different AR lenses, that's how we talk about them. And uh, people can sponsor those lenses so they appear higher up uh, in, in sort of our, our, list of, our list of AR experiences. So most of your money comes from advertising and some of it comes from products that you sell and sponsorships that you sell on top of those products, is that it? Yeah, primarily from advertising, and we're, we're sort of dabbling in experimental hardware as well. Okay. So today, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, there is a report that your company has been keeping a secret dossier, or I'm guessing Google Doc, on Facebook, <laughs> enumerating the various ways that Facebook has engaged in anti-competitive behavior against Snapchat. Now first, can you legally describe to me what some of these accusations are? Well, I think at a really high level, uh, I guess several years ago, our team started hearing stories from you know, influencers that were using Facebook or Instagram or something like that, you know, getting pressured to stop putting their Snapchat username, or you know, we heard stories about Snapchat content getting suppressed on, on Facebook or Instagram. And so we, we actually heard so many of these stories, and obviously there have been tons of articles written about it, that we just started collecting it uh, in one place. And what was the dossier named? Uh, our, our legal team has a sense of humor, so this was the Voldemort dossier. The Voldemort dossier. Uh, so the Wall Street Journal reported that among the various things that Facebook was doing was they were reducing the visibility of Snapchat content on their platform, and they were finding various ways to threaten Snapchat users to essentially de-verify them or reduce the visibility of their content on Instagram. Why does this matter? Why, why does this sort of anti-competitive behavior matter to a company like Snap? Well, I think at a high level, uh, as a business, but also as a country, we believe in competition uh, and, and you know, relatively fair competition. It's actually one of the things that's really fun about the tech industry. You have so many smart people all trying to figure out how to build really great and interesting products. Um, and you know, I, I think you know, that competition often drives better outcomes for uh, consumers. So for example, you know, when we started building our product, we you know, thought a lot about things like privacy that at the time, eight years ago, weren't very important to people. But over time, it became more and more important that consumers actually do care about privacy. They do care about how their data is used. And so now many other companies in the tech industry care about privacy as well. And we, we sort of paved, paved the way there. And so I think that's an example where, you know, Competition can actually help you know, different companies figure out how to best serve consumers. And so I think there's some concern today, and obviously I think this is less the case for Snapchat. We've been able to build a really big, successful public company. We have you know, I mean, 13 to 34 year olds in the United States. We reach more people than Facebook or Instagram. And so Snapchat here is kind of the success story, I would say, but I think if you look at the industry, there's some concern that smaller companies maybe never get off the ground uh, because of fears of competition. So when Bobby and I were starting Snapchat, you know, I remember there was a really famous venture capitalist who came to one of my uh, Stanford classes, and we were talking, and afterwards I sent him an email, and I said, hey, you know, we have 100,000 people using Snapchat. It's really exciting. We'd love to talk with you. Maybe we can raise some money. And he wrote back and said, you know, it sounds like you're flying in the face of some big bad bruisers. And that was it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I think we were like, what, what did that mean? Just just spell out the big. That bad there were some really big competitors that we had to worry about, and I think that was something we heard time and time again. We we continue to hear today that you know how is Snapchat going to succeed if there are these really big competitors? And what we believe and what's you know worked for us so far is that we just continue to innovate. And so I think you know what will be important for us as a country and you know for the technology industry as a whole is that we continue uh, to support an environment with free and fair competition. And I think you know there's some concern that some companies have behaved in practices that would be considered anti-competitive, meaning that they want no competition mm -hmm. rather than fair competition. And so I think you know, that's something that we've thought a lot about. And I, I think as a country and as a business, we, we, we uh, enjoy a good competition. It's just a question of whether these companies are using their power to suppress competition and suppress innovation in America. Well, let me spin this logic forward a little bit and put you to the point. If, if competitive, if competition is for, at the national interest, if the federal government has a natural a national interest in maintaining competition and making sure that, level, that the playing field is relatively level for startups, and Facebook is engaging in anti-competitive anti -competitive behavior enumerated by your dossier, Project Voldemort, do you support fines on Facebook? Do you support a breakup of Facebook to ensure that this kind of behavior doesn't continue? I really think that's for the regulators to figure out, frankly. I mean, I think at a high level, they're, they're sort of stuck in a, in a tricky position at the moment. And what I mean by that is these large tech companies have become so important to our national security, to innovation, because they're investing huge amounts of money in the future. So for example, Google over the weekend just announced they've had a huge breakthrough in quantum computing, right? That's really important. We need big technology companies to be able to continue to invest in these sorts of innovations. At the same time, we have to find a way for you know, small companies, entrepreneurs, to be able to build their businesses and, and compete fairly with those large businesses. So I don't envy the, the challenge the regulators are facing, because we're going to have to find a way to make it work for everyone. But is this the kind of information, the kind of information that you're collecting on Facebook, is that the sort of thing that you'd want the FTC to see when they're making a decision about how to regulate these kind of companies? You know, to be honest, I think the vast majority of the information is already in the public domain, and I think that's why they're looking into it. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that for an answer, I suppose. Um, the underlying philosophy of Snapchat is a little bit different than Facebook and, and Twitter, and I think it's important just to, to put a point into that. You've talked a lot publicly about how you see some of the sort of competition and the status mongering that exists on Twitter and Facebook as being somewhat pernicious to its users. What do you think is wrong with social media as it exists outside of Snapchat, and what is your solution to that problem? Well, I think at a, at a really high level, Bobby and I, when we were building Snapchat, were really lucky because we actually got to learn from a lot of these sort of bigger companies that had preceded us. And you know, the last 20 years of the internet have really been about experimentation, right? These were sort of small ideas, projects that you know grew very, very quickly and now really dramatically impact the world. And I think you know, in many cases, these experiments have had a hugely positive impact, uh, you know, on, on people's lives. But in some cases, I think they've created challenges. Um, um, and and we, we identified a few of these early on. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, Snapchat was sort of built on this idea of ephemerality, right? The notion that most of the conversations that you have day to day aren't recorded, they aren't stored forever. And that actually by, by having ephemerality as a part of your conversation, you feel less pressure uh, when you're communicating because everything isn't being recorded. It's not like a giant interview on a stage like this. Um, you know, it's a more casual uh, and private conversation. And that was a, a very novel idea at the time because all of your internet conversations were recorded forever, for the most part. Uh, and you know, there, there was another idea we had really around, as you mentioned, sort of likes and comments. We felt that people uh, felt like they had to perform all the time for their friends. They felt like they were on stage and they felt a lot of pressure to appear pretty and perfect. And what that meant is actually their range of communication was very narrow, right? There aren't that many times in your life where you feel, you know, Pretty and perfect, at least for me. I don't know. Um, and, <laughs> and you want to be able to communicate the whole range uh, of human emotion. And so we realized that if you remove some of these success metrics around content online, people feel more comfortable expressing all of who they are, not just the pretty and perfect moments. And then lastly, you know, and this is a big one, I think people are, you know, care a lot about this, we noticed that a lot of the media content being distributed on social media was really being distributed by your friends, uh, not editors, right? Um, and so friends were often sharing articles 
uh, that, that maybe weren't accurate or were inflammatory. And then depending on how many people liked those articles or clicked on those articles, those articles got a lot of distribution. And we saw a real opportunity to work with publications to bring editorialized content to our platform so that the editor's voice can really take you through these stories and provide sort of a, a broader point of view. So I think we were lucky to sort of learn a couple of these things along the way by watching some of these uh, companies that, that came before us and by thinking about our business uh, differently. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally see the point that you're making. I think that the success metrics that exist across social media are, are really bad, especially for teens who are so exquisitely sensitive to what their peers think of them. I, like, I do think that that sort of layer of social media is truly dangerous. At the same time, Facebook is huge and Twitter is huge. And it is possible for people to want something that is bad for them. And I wonder sometimes when people are designing apps, m mostly that are far less successful than Snap, but designing apps that are trying to make, trying to elicit sort of the better angels of our nature, that sometimes they're sort of designing or building kale chips for the fast food consumer, you know, that ultimately what people want are the success metrics. Do you ever think about that? Think about the tension between like designing a product that might be really popular, even though, yes, it, it might in some way be bad for your users? Gosh, you know, I th my, my wife always tells me to find the balance, you know, like 80-20, because I'm a big fast food guy. <laughs> so 20% fast food, 80% healthy. Uh, you know, I think, um, I, I think sort of as we look at uh, building these products, I, you know, I think there's one theme that's, that's coming out that really is at the heart of what you're talking about and, and really the tricky thing we're grappling with as a society. And that is this idea uh, that, that social media really enabled, which is that anyone in the world can say anything they want to millions and millions of people. That is the novel concept, I think, that is creating a lot of this friction in our society. And the reason why I think that's happening is because we don't have a framework to cope with that. So historically, you know, last 100 years, we thought of this, you know, you know, communication really in two ways. You can either like talk with your friends, telecommunications, right? There's a whole regulatory framework for that. You can communicate in private. You and I could have a crazy conversation, say all sorts of really insulting things, and it's not a problem. Right, you know, our, our privacy is respected. Maybe some feelings are hurt, but that's okay. And I think on the flip side, you have broadcast communication, where if you're gonna, you know, go on television and say something to millions and millions of people, there's actually a, a set of regulations, rules, and expectations about what you can and can't communicate. And so I, I think at the heart of this is that there's something in the middle now that's been created by social media, which is that anyone in the world can broadcast anything they want to millions and millions of people. And we can argue about sort of the metrics around that, likes or comments, and what that does to that sort of communication, but as a society, we need to decide if that's something that's okay. Um, if it's okay for anyone to be able to say whatever they want to millions and millions of people. And so I think that's sort of, as I look at the landscape, what people are really debating and, and sort of tussling over uh, is whether or not that has a place in our society, and if it does, how we're going to regulate that behavior. No, you're right. I think it's true that for a long time there was a really bright line between social communication and broadcast communication, between sort of telephones, clearly a one-to-one -one connection, and television, which was clearly a one-to-many connection, and that social media sort of blurs that line. I feel like if you look at the last decade, for most of the last decade, we were grappling with this novelty of social media. And we basically said, this is fun, this is interesting, we'll see how it works. And sometime in the last, I would say, three years really, since 2016, there's really been a backlash against technology, against the way that Google treats breaking news, against the way that Facebook treats uh, you know, false information, and even the way that Twitter uh, treats things like abuse. Do you think that the tech lash that we've seen in the last three years has been a do comeuppance, or do you think that it's become a little bit too much of a moral panic? You know, in, in my view, it's really a reflection of the fact that what started as a lot of, frankly, experimentation with a very new uh, technology, the internet, has now become so integral to people's lives that it can really have an impact on how they feel, how they think, how they work, like uh, how they live. And so I, I think given that evolution, we're now you know, seeing um, that, that we have to make some choices as a society about uh, what sort of products we, we want, what maybe we need to regulate, what products we don't want. And I think 
you know, in, in many ways, this is part of the natural evolution of a new technology uh, because, you know, many times in these experiments, uh, you know, frankly, the, the people working on these products maybe didn't anticipate that they would even become so successful. And I think that's a little bit of the problem that there's a sense of fear today uh, about technology mm -hmm. rather than an understanding that we've, we've created this technology as humans. Every time I hear someone say, oh gosh, the algorithms are gonna take over, I have to remind you know, people that humans write those algorithms. We can write those algorithms to do whatever we want. And so I think taking a step back and, and sort of thinking through the technologies that we want to build to serve our values will be a really important sort of topic of conversation now that technology has become integral to the way that we live. Yeah. I, I want to close with a question about sort of your creative process, because for better or worse, Snapchat is in many ways considered sort of the research and development department of social media, that you guys come up with all of these brilliant ideas, and then, as elucidated by Project Voldemort, sometimes other companies take them for themselves. One of the most important ideas that you guys came up with is this concept of stories, the idea that a brilliant way to share information online would be for individuals to create mini movies of themselves that they could share with their friends, and that would be how they would sort of communicate uh, with, with their entire network. Take me back to the beginning of stories. When you guys were first coming up with that idea, was it a popular idea with your user base? Well, in the very early days, I think it was so new that it was just a huge failure. I mean, so no one used it for the, for the first uh, several months. And I, I think that's, that's really because it, it created a totally new type of behavior that, in a sense, was nostalgic. So if we, if we go back to when stories uh, were created, you know, we really created stories in response to what our community was asking for. They wanted a send to all button. So, you know, people were sending snaps to their friends. They said, gosh, I wish I could just hit send to all. The snaps would go to all my friends and they could all see what I'm up to. We realized that if we create a send all button, people would just spam their friends all day long and they'd end up hating Snapchat. And so uh, what we decided to do was create a way for, for people to you know, share content with all of their friends, uh, but without spamming them. And, and so in order to do that, we learned about the other ways people were doing that at the time. And that was primarily social media. And social media had a couple issues. You know, first and foremost, the feed that you know, is social media is famous for is actually in reverse chronological order in most cases. And so if you were posting photos from your birthday party, you'd, sort, you'd see the end of the birthday party and then the middle and the beginning. And it just didn't make sense because we've been telling stories in chronological order for, you know, I guess thousands of years or whatever. Um, so that didn't make a whole lot of sense to us, and we wanted to create a product where you could tell a story in chronological order. And then, you know, another thing that we noticed was that on social media, as I mentioned before, people felt pressure because there were lots of likes and comments, so we didn't have any of that, and you could just express how you felt in the moment. Um, and, and at the beginning, people didn't really understand what stories were for, but over time, obviously, the, the product got momentum, and now today, it's, it's become a platform where, you know, not only does our community create stories, but also publishers, as I mentioned, production companies, et cetera, all create narratives, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, I feel like the, there's, there's a deep point embedded there, which is that you created this product that initially was absolutely just despised by your consumers. Like, they didn't use it. They were like, I know I can use it. I know it'd be free. There's no cost to me to use this thing, and I'm not going to use it. But that very thing that was initially rejected is now maybe the most popular form of social media engagement across platforms, for you, for Instagram, across Facebook. What do you think that says about sort of how you as an innovator, not just a founder and a CEO, but as an innovator, have to lead consumers on your platform in order to keep it more engaging, even if all they want is just the same old, same old? I think it's less about uh, leading consumers than it is about really listening, um, and then being able to take risks and not basing all of your decisions on engagement data, right? And so I think like, you know, maybe in a traditional technology company, you know, the stories product would have just gotten killed after a few months because no, one's, no one was using it. But we, you know, really believed in the philosophy behind the product um, and, and what we thought that it could, you know, do for, for our community. And so we kept at it and, you know, eventually uh, it, it's, it started growing. So I think it's much more a reflection of, of taking risks and, and the willingness to do that sort of in service of the community than it is about leading them. All right, Evan, thank you. Thank you.